How do you survive an EMP attack? How do you survive an attack on electromagnetic pulse or anything else that brings our grid down? That's what I'm going to be talking about here. I'm going to talk about several different aspects of surviving this event. And we're going to go in detail on some of these aspects. We're going to talk about things such as how you can grow enough food on a tenth of an acre to feed four people. I'm going to tell you what to grow, where to grow it, and how to grow it. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, some of the biggest challenges to you after a grid goes down, like, uh, like security, perimeter defense. We're going to talk about foxholes. We're going to talk about sectors of fire. You may be knowing that stuff, but what you may not know is a biggest threat to an EMP survivor, to the prepper, is going to be snipers. After the zombie horde gets through and makes their way through, that is, the snipers are going to be a huge threat. How do you deal with a sniper? I'm going to cover that. I'm going to tell you how to take a sniper out, how to flush them out. But you're going to need a squad, a team of two groups of individuals, two teams that, that, that would outflank them. I'm going to talk into that. So we're going to go in a lot of detail in here. But of course, we're going to talk about the key essentials of uh, water and food and things like that. But also, also, we're going to talk about, uh, of course, how to save your electronics. That's everybody, what everybody thinks is going to be the first thing we're going to talk about. But no, we're going to put that toward the end because that should be about number seven on your priority list. It is important that you do uh, safeguard your electronics if you can because communications are vital. There will be an initial force multiplier like uh, your, your cordless drills and things like that, those little impact drills, but they're all going to wear out. <laughs> so you need something more permanent down the road because you're in this for the long haul, even though some of you don't believe that. So hang on, guys. We are going to start this show right now. Here we are, guys. Grid defense. What to do? What are you going to do? Suddenly the grid has gone down. Maybe it was a war. What happened? Boom. You're in trouble. So it has hit the fan. What are you going to do now? Well, let's roll the clock back and think about what you should have done. What actually you can do now. Because if we fail to take action, this grid is going to go down. Even if uh, everybody in the world is lovey-dovey and nobody would dare do anything to, to hurt another person, attack a grid, uh, Mother Nature will do it for us. The sun will take our grid out eventually. So, and by the way, I have done a presentation uh, on uh, the balloon threat from China. I actually wrote a 44-page white paper, which is delivered to the, the uh, uh, Security uh, Homeland Security uh, Committees of the Senate and House to Senators Rob Johnson and uh, Congressman Mark Green on behalf of the EMP Task Force and National and Homeland Security, for which I am the state director, uh, Alabama state director. And I'm just going to briefly mention it here. I'll do a bigger paper on this in the future. But guys, from a balloon altitude, uh, which is not the same as the, the altitude you take out the entire country, but you can take out a lot of key targets with just a few, few balloons. And believe you me, we could pull off all these miss, missions cheaper than AIM-9 missile. Guys, uh, what you can do from a balloon is incredible and are incredibly cheap and easy to operate for a balloon EMP platform. So that's the scary thing about it. And if you get these coastal areas, which are uh, highly, highly viable, because most of our people live on the coast. we got a lot of military command control, naval facilities, and all kinds of things. Also, you might want to you know, take out some of those missiles up there. But all this can be done from a balloon. And China actually has just come out and admitted that they're, part of the purpose of their balloons isn't just reconnaissance, it's the strike capabilities. I think they might have accidentally mentioned that. Because China has actually developed the capability on thousands of these things. That's why I shown the swarm earlier. And yeah, they are testing weapons. That is what is hanging here. That, that like little DF-17 it should be DF, not DR. 17 uh, glide vehicles, hypersonic vehicles. Drop in from a balloon, guys. I'll talk about this more in the future. Here's what you might do from balloons. You might do some kind of combination saturation strike that would cover this country so extensively, uh, nothing electrical is going to make it. Uh, oh, yeah, even your hardened facilities are challenged, guys. <laughs> we'll talk about that more in the future. Oh, yeah, and I'll still be down on a shoestring budget, guys. This is what I was doing. 20, this was one of my missions 23 years ago. I started this kind of stuff 25 years ago from the Gulf of Mexico. That's, and, uh, that's how long I've been launching stuff at sea. 25 years, guys. So this, this was 23 years ago. So take it seriously. Now, guys. It may not be an, an EMP that takes down our grid, and our grid could be permanently damaged by people. 
people, there are certain things you can do to the, these large transformers that would destroy them, make the, the coils fry. And you could do this with ballistic attacks or if you know what you're doing, hand tools. <laughs> you don't even need a bang, bang. Oh my gosh, guys. So this is scary. But uh, it was identified by NERC, I believe, several years ago that uh, they, the uh, grid could be entirely taken down in the United States, that's National uh, Electric Reliability Corporation, by taking out nine critical substations, totally take out the American grid. Somebody told this to the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and said, hey, get news. all you got to do is take out nine. He laughed. He says, nine? I've already got sleeper cells, 20 sleeper cells in America, and they've targeted 20 of these substations. Of course, one sleeper cell wants to hit one, could move on to another, but they got 20 top priority targets set up right now. And that was umpty up years ago now. How many more? How many more sleeper cells? Who else has sleeper cells? North Korea, China, Iran. Uh, yeah, of course, Iran. Who else has got them? What damage could they do? It could be ugly, guys. So uh, this is uh, something to take very serious for the security of our grid. Now, Guys, a lot of people are telling me that, oh, well, our grid is secure because we got this, that, and the other. I'm going to tell you what, I'm part of uh, two different national level EMP task force groups. And we've got hundreds of engineers and scientists on board our groups. And all the stuff that they're talking about and saying is, is, is covering it will not. And here's something you got to bear in mind what's at most risk are these large, high power, uh, long distance uh, transformers. There's thousands of these in the country. If everything was working, uh, and you lost these, it would take 10 years to replace them at rates, you know, current rates of production. Maybe if you if ramp it up, you'd have to ramp it up to do that, by the way. You'd have to ramp up production rates because production rates really just cover new installations and, and you know, some occasional repair. Most of these things are in service for decades. There's only about six of these uh, uh, platforms, trailers, and about six rail cars that can move this stuff. These are huge. They weigh two to 400 tons. The uh, elements in them, the, the windings are hand wound. Now, South, now some people don't realize, yeah, little, even little storms take out some of these. Uh, South Africa had some of these taken out a few years ago. Now, we're not going to pay all that money. We'll hand wind them ourselves. Well, theirs failed in about two years, uh, the ones they hand wound, because their techs weren't competent. They didn't, weren't, didn't have the skill level to wind them uh, properly. And so they fell, they fell right off the bat. So that there, there is value to having knowledgeable technicians that know how to do this stuff. And these are all custom designed to fit the grid they go in. So there's, so there's not even a really a good modular approach, although that would be helpful. But it takes 18 months to get one of these on your loading dock after you order it. That's providing everything is working. But we're talking about a world where you don't have your bank account to pay for it. You don't have the internet to order it. And once you do get it, uh, after a year, nine tenths of people are projected to die out due to societal collapse. Where are you going to be 18 months out? You don't have a workforce to install. It's hard enough to find workers today. So how are you going to manage to start replacing these things? I don't see it. Humpty Dumpty's fell off the wall, and I don't see them coming back. That's the way I. That's the way I see it, guys. This is it. Uh, I don't see it coming back in our lifetime. And there's many other devices on grids that, that's vulnerable too, like the. The supervisor controlling data acquisition units, the SCADAs, which are basically PLC computers. There's a lot of stuff. I go on that in more detail in other videos, but just suffice it to say this is a serious problem, a long-term problem, and that's why we have to think long-term. So, guys, here we are. You got a city, and about the only lights it's got now is the campfires or burning buildings or whatever is burning below. The city is desperate. Of course, you're going to have military groups uh, in action if they're in, they may be running from the mobs. But they're probably going to come out the countryside to try to steal stuff. But that ain't the main thing you want to worry about, guys. The biggest thing is this. you got a city. Several of our cities have millions of people. Some mega cities, there's a few that's got up to 20 million people in a city. You take cities like New York, Los Angeles. They're, you, know, you get in the lot, greater Los, basin there in Los Angeles, you get about 20 million. New York's, what, 10 million maybe? I have to look it up. But there's... We're talking millions and millions of people. And a lot of cities have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even smaller cities, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands is typical in a city. All these people are sitting in there. There's no food. There's no water. Nothing moves because there's no power. You can't even pump fuel because fuel takes power. Everything takes power. All they got is for campfires. See the red glow? There is no way for these people to eat or drink. They're 
desperate. Their, their desperation is off the charts. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? They're coming to your front door. That's where they're going. So what do you want to do about it? This thing's too many charts. Yeah, that's what they're going to look like in your front door, my friends, to you. Yeah, that's a pretty ugly picture. <laughs> it's going to be your equivalent of a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, that looks a little worse than reality. Because those are non-functional beings. But you get the pitch. It's going to be an ugly day when all these people pour out of the cities as far as they can go. So you don't even not want to be in a city where cannibalism is probably going to be the rule of the day. You don't want to be in a city. Even in the countryside, if they're not coming to get what you got, they're coming to get you. Because they're hungry. They're desperate. So what's a guy to do? What's a girl to do in a situation like this where the grid's down? Well, guys, uh, that's what we're covering here. Now, uh, again, it's important to note that parties may vary according to the area you're in. Uh, if this is a local event, which I'm thinking we're probably in a full-blown attack or a solar event, which will be nationwide or global. But whatever the case, adaptability and resilience is important. Resourcefulness and you now to rely on our communities in such circumstances. So, you know, the reason I'm saving electronics for last in this presentation or close to last is, like I said, the grid may not come back in our lifetime. Electronic communication and power tools, of course, are a huge initial force multiplier, but they will all wear out. Even the solar panels will wear out. Your uh, wind generators, all your power generation, all your power consumption equipment, that stuff will wear out. Hey. If I had a choice between a brace and a bit and a, uh, if I had to choose and, and my bug out or whatever, between a brace and a bit and a uh, uh, cordless impact driver, let's see it here, like this one, what am I going to choose? Oh, these are great. I love them. But in a survival situation, no, if I had to choose, I'd take the brace and bit. Yeah, it's got some bearings in it. But I, those bearings last for generations. i got some. Blacksmith blowers in the back that are over 100 years old and they still turn. So, <clears throat> man, they got more loads on them, been in worse environments than, than a bracing bit. So, <clears throat> what you got to understand the important thing for survival, the important rule for survival is the rules of three. The rules of three. You can survive only three minutes without air. You can survive only three hours exposed to the elements. Now, that's like, you know, real bad situations, like where it's really cold or really hot uh desert or especially the arctic you know cold region is what's going to get you you can only survive well they'll all get you with the three hour limit you, know, you may not even make it three hours in uh alaska <laughs> the siberia places i've been uh you can only survive three days without water you can only but you can survive 30 days without food so what should be your top priorities what are your top priorities uh, your power devices are important, but they should not be your top priority. Your survival is going to be your top priority. And yeah, air. So you better have some means of breathing clean air if you're in a smoky attack city. But guys, if it's a chemical situation, say her eyes are not protected. Okay, that's better. At least she's got her eyes protected now. But if it were a chemical or biological attack, you'd need your whole body covered. And you need what, really a mop suit, what the military uses. But those things are god awful hot because it's not wearing a blanket because they you're really wearing clothes filled with uh, layers of carbon. Phew, they're hot. Uh, so, guys, what you can do right now, the thing you can start doing right this minute is storing food and water because resources are going to be limited afterwards. So this this gives you a a, a head a head start. You're really going to have to grow your own food, but it's going to maybe take you a while to get your uh, skills down to the point where you can really feed yourself that way. So this is a force multiplier to help you survive as you acquire the skills to feed yourself. Otherwise, it's also uh, something you should barter, and it gives you a little variety, so you, maybe you have something to eat besides what's in your garden. <laughs> and like I've told you many times, go to the big box. You know, make it first. Make a list. What is it that you use? on a day-to-day -day basis and try to match and emulate that as much as possible with long-term food storage and water storage. That's what you need to do. But you can't bug out with all these jars, so you better have some bug out type food too. Now, this little lady here, she, she don't have enough. She's kind of sad. <laughs> she's a little happier. She's got a little bit, but she's a little suspect. This guy, lady here, she's stocked up. She's happy. <laughs> but guys, again, uh, these are canned foods. Now, you wouldn't want to put these cans in a backpack 
Those are hard. Uh, they got a lot of water in them. So what you need is long-term food storage if we're bugging out. Uh, so we'll talk about that more in a minute. But guys, think about this. A lot of people don't think about this in the prepping, but meats are vital. The meats may be hard to come up with. So if you can store some hams, some salted pork, better yet, have your own smokehouse and do it yourself. Make your own salted and smoked meats. This is a good skill to develop. It's a trade for the future. And we'll talk about some other trades and skills you can have when all this goes down. So this is something to consider to keep you above the ground. All right, guys, for that long-term food storage, you can go to printwithgreg.com. You can get food to last 25 years, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 2,000 calories plus a day. That'll keep you alive and well. So and not only that, if you click on the My Patient Supply logo, it goes into other prepping supplies to include water filters, air filters, like, you know, for your house, HIPAA filter, what I said, three minutes without air. So consider that. <clears throat> and also, uh, right now we got a special. It may not be, if you watch this video later, that may not be available. $200 of the free survival gear with a, a purchase, which is discounted. So check it out. All right, guys. X, again, that was prepwithgreg.com. Prepwithgreg.com. Okay, guys, let's look at the water. Access to water. Now, clearing water is vital for survival, but uh, you got to purify and sanitize your water. What a lot of people don't realize is purification and sanitizing is two different things. To purify is to take out the sediments, the dirty stuff, to make the water basically clear. Sanitizing is killing the bad stuff in it. Now, I got another video, which you really should watch, that covers many means to purify and sanitize your water, including stuff you can do with plastic bottles and five-gallon buckets. So you need to watch that video. And I talk about the difference between uh, filters like this and ceramic filters. Now, what you got to bear in mind is these ceramic filters will take out Giardia. Most of them will. And Giardia can really make you sick. And there's uh, one of the uh, uh, homestead uh, prepping type channels, bushcraft channels on here where the guy, main character, uh, got Giardia. He was extremely careful. He just wasn't careful enough. So it made him real sick. So you, you got to pay a lot of attention. So you got to be careful. But there's also viruses in the water. And the viruses will not be taken out by mere, uh, by mere uh, filtering, guys. So here we are. We've got uh, some water here. Any water source is going to be vital with the grid down. And that's probably fitted water, standing water, probably full of bacteria, nasty stuff, maybe excrement, God knows what. You really got to filter that out, purify it, and sanitize it. And if you had a, a water filter, they won't last. Those you buy don't have a, the, they falsely advertise how long they're good. Or you can filter 100,000 gallons of water. Well, if it's clean water, yeah, maybe, possibly. But uh, dirty water, it ain't going to last that long. So you, I would suggest you build your own water filters, like the methods I teach in that other video, to pre-filter things, to get some of that junk out, especially if you've got fetid water like this. All right, that looks beautiful. A lot of people are tempted to drink from a stream like that up in the mountains. That's wonderful, except uh, you don't know what's upstream. You don't know what's lying dead in the waters above you. You don't know what just did its business in the waters above you. So, yeah, you know, hey, even snails can be uh, deadly. So you don't know what's up there in that water, what you might get. So, yeah, that's a good start to uh, take that water and filter it. At least you're getting the Giardia out. But I highly encourage you to do something else. Whoa, we, presentation's running away on me. I'll not redo this because I don't have time. I have, this is my fourth shot to make this video. And too many interruptions. Okay, guys, here you are. This is one good way to sanitize the water is to boil it. Get it up to a good boil for about three minutes. Uh, you can also take clear water and put it in a small plastic jug and stick in your backpack and let it stay in the ultraviolet light for a couple hours. I talked about that in the other video too. There's many ways to actually sanitize your water, but this is vital because you don't want to get that bacteria or especially the viruses. You might filter the bacteria. Up. There's the viruses, guys. This will kill the viruses. All right, grow food, guys, not cigars. <laughs> You got to have a place and a plan in, in action to, to, for food production, storage, and distribution to include agriculture and livestock. Yes, you're going to need meats. 
All right, here I am uh, holding some wheat in a field behind my house last fall. So their DeVay's family in Pasadena, California, grows 7,000 pounds of food a year on a tenth of an acre using raised bed gardening. Raised beds are important because you don't compress the soil. They're far more productive on a square foot basis than the garden row gardens, far more productive. Now, they don't raise all the food they eat. They actually uh, uh, raise high value food that they can sell. So the, all the food except for the grain products is what they raise. They sell their food and make enough money off the excess food to make a living, including buying the grain products to get their finish their nutrition out. Well, at the rate they're doing it for, that covers three and a half people. They presently have three people living on the farm. First time I visited them, their dad was still alive, it was four. So you can increase this though, if you could like grow in greenhouses and increase the CO2 content by just 20%. You know, you can get uh, 8,400 pounds of food per uh, tenth of acre under that scenario. But you take care of 4.2 people. That is not my technique to show you how to feed uh, for people. We're gonna, I'm going to show a totally different, more practical technique. Because here, they're mainly growing salad grains. You need a better balanced diet. We're going to go all into that. I also mentioned, hey, you can use aquaponics tubes overhead as a multiplier to increase that because most of the stuff don't need the full sunlight anyway. So uh, all these foods could be grown. A lot of actually be grown in your home. Here I am at their urban homestead. And behind them was like a like a 14 lane highway, uh, seven lanes on each side is crazy. The interstate behind these guys are in Pasadena, California, in a city. Don't say, Greg, I live in the city, I can't grow anything. I got videos to show you how to grow stuff in your living room, like microgreens. And that's not the only thing you can grow in your house, guys. And this is wintertime. This is my video with them, guys. This is my video with this family. It's on this channel. This is the first part. This part, I'm interviewing them in the garage. The second part, I'm actually uh, touring the garden with them. So I made this uh, two or three years ago, okay? So check that out. So American needs, uh, as in 2011, they said an American need 1,996 pounds of food per year. 1,996 pounds of food per year, kind of like 2,000 calories a day, maybe 1,800. Definitely not 800, which is a lot of your survival food, that's all they give you. So here, here's a little garden I have, which my mushroom house is here right now. Just to show you, this is my raised beds. My first spin raised beds are vital. If you don't have raised beds, you can use uh, lumber. You can uh, line them with metal. You can use rock, stone, blocks, you know, many things to, to keep the dirt contained. So this is just how I did it because I cleared all these trees. I had a lot of logs. <laughs> but you're clearing out woods. There's a raised uh, trellis for some tomatoes just getting started here. There's some corn. Just give you some idea. All right, so use raised beds because they grow far more than row beds. You can grow a lot more food in a raised bed because you're not uh, compressing the soil. Unless you're out in a real dry climate, but then you want to make sure you, you have designated areas you walk in, but still you can get some soil compression. So the, what raised beds buy you is avoiding soil compression, which can greatly increase your productivity. And also the way you plant will be different. Uh, use row covers, uh, low tunnels, high tunnels. You can do all these things are force multipliers to get more growth out of your area. I'm not even talk, going to talk about this. When I, uh, what I tell you how to grow the food in a little bit, it's not even using any of this stuff. That will give you an additional force multiplier to grow more food. So, but you know, plant three or more crops per, per year on a bed. You have stuff that you can plant and cut and come again. Like some lettuces, you know, you cut them off and they'll grow right back. All right, guys, this is a aquaponics system. That's good if you can produce your power. Like I said, it's going to be a short-term proposition. But, you know, maybe you got a windmill and you can pump the water up with a windmill. You say this could go over. Most greenhouses have a cover cloth because it's too hot in the summertime. So they got to cool them down. So you could have stuff growing at multiple layers. Yeah, use multiple layers of foliage to capture, to capture the sun, just like in the woods. Uh, put as many roots in the ground as possible. Uh, feed, uh, he uh, you got heavy feeders, feed them lots of uh, compost tea, worm tea, worm castings. But I use rock dust, bone meal, and blood meal in your garden to augment your nutrition. You don't need any fertilizers, guys, nothing like that. So uh, here we are. This is the key to growing the food. You're going to need a balanced diet. And we call it the, the food forest with the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of this. Beans make the nitrous for the corn. Corn provides a trellis for the beans. 
but squash often tears down the corn. <laughs> so if you do that reason, you might choose to, to grow something other than squash. Uh, you might want to grow sweet potatoes, peanuts, lettuce, spinach, those kind of things. And you might even grow lettuce while the sweet potatoes are spreading out or squash for that matter. Now there I am with some sweet potatoes. That's my foot. So these are huge taters that I grew several years ago. All right, nut trees can give you the fats and proteins you need. So if you can plant nut trees, that's important. So uh, this, I don't know, that first number, that's another per something else. Let's see, it takes three to four years to start producing with a pecan tree. I think that's when it first starts producing, yeah, three pounds. But they go grow significantly beyond that. See, uh, significant production can be achieved in six to eight years of a pecan tree. But hazelnuts are really the way to go. Because hazelnuts grow fast and uh, they mature quick, quickly. Uh, yeah, that's all pecan trees, I believe. So, yep. Let's see. Nut trees, fats and proteins. This talks to the hazelnuts here. All right. This, this talks about wheat, corn, and potatoes, what you get from a tenth of an acre. If you had a tenth of an acre of wheat, uh, you could produce enough food to last you 320 days. Uh, corn, 605 days. That'd feed two per people if all you ate was corn. <laughs> potatoes, if all you ate was potatoes, you'd uh, be good for maybe almost three years for uh, or three people for a year. Almost. That's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about using the three sisters here. Here's what you do. You can put 484 of these squares. This is a nine square foot uh, arrangement here in a tenth of an acre and neglecting walkways. Uh, or you can put 403 in a twelfth of an acre. So uh, I think I got that backwards there. But yeah, with, with walkways. So guys, here's what you can do, guys. Uh, you plant your, your tall growers in the corners. Put the beans around and put the, your vine and stuff like your sweet potatoes, your squash in the middle, and it will cover all this. But while the process covers, you could plant some more stuff in here. Oh, yeah, you can use trellises to cover your walkways too, guys. And you can still grow overhead. All right, plant corn and okra nine inches in each into each of the corner. Yeah, nine inches in. Plant, uh, you know, so foot each way, right? So plant uh, two to three looms around uh, each corn plant. And then uh, start the corn in the spring when it first gets seeded in the ground, or you can do okra instead of corn. Uh, when the heat arrives, plant uh, sweet potatoes and beans. Three layers. So you got the corn, which grows tall, or okra, beans, squash, potatoes, a ground cover. So you got a ground cover, help hold the weeds down as the sweet potatoes spread out. The beans hopefully are heading up the, the uh, stalks by then. <laughs> so that's how you do it, guys. It'll also help the weeding with a ground cover of potatoes or, or squash. So uh, this is the calories that you can get. Now this, now this is using a raised bed. You won't get this out of a row crop in the field. Uh, but with raised beds, you can get this. Corn, 780 calories per plant. Well, for per plant basis, it's still pretty close. Sweet potatoes, if you're making five pounds, you get 1,740 calories. Beans, uh, this is the low end variety, 1,600 calories. So the total of the calories you can grow in nine square foot off of one crop is 6,480. If you got a greenhouse, you can extend this, right? The row covers and some of the stuff I was talking about earlier. But on a tenth of an acre, 484 of these would give you over 3 million calories divided by 2,000, how many calories you need a day, would cover a person for 1,563 days divided by 365 the number of days in a year. You could actually feed 4.28 people, over four people with a balanced diet. You would have your calories, uh, your, your starches with your corn, you would have your uh, or sweet potatoes, you would have the beans with the protein. So it's a pretty balanced meal, pretty close. Uh, so you need about 1,700 square foot per person. That's what it boils down to. But you got to stay on top of it. You got to manage it and keep the bugs picked off. So I said plant open instead of corn, peanuts instead of uh, sweet potatoes is brown cover. My three sisters, corn, winter squash. Yeah, it's winter squash. Beans and sweet potatoes. You get the starch and the protein. And the key thing is you can store these all year. You don't need a refrigerator. The grid's down. It's perfect prepper food. Corn, sweet potatoes, winter squash, all store for a long time. That's the cool thing. So, guys, on a tenth of an acre, considering America's got a four point, no, 42 million acres of lawns, you could feed 1.68 billion people just from our lawns. 
Who says we got too many people? Grow food, not grass. Good grief, guys. What a waste. That's just downright ugly. <laughs> but Greg, well, I can't grow a garden when there ain't no stores. How am I going to buy my seeds? How am I going to get my fertilizers, my pesticides, my herbicides, all this stuff and all the poison that makes me so sick? <laughs> Don't use it. <laughs> For one, seeds. You need heirloom seeds. You need seeds that when you plant them in the ground, you will get the same uh, plant back. Once you, when you plant them in the ground, you grow it, you harvest the seed. When they harvest the seed, when you plant it, you get the same plant back. The hybrid seeds, the hybrid plants will not do that for you. You're going to get something gnarly back. They're not going to get the same thing you planted. So I highly encourage you to either go to my link below on this video or True Leaf Market or Eden Brothers. They both sell heirloom seeds. In fact, that's all they have. Heirloom seeds, the kind of seeds you need to uh, be able to keep your garden growing year after year to get started with. So check these links out, my friends. And I promote global worming. Yes, I proudly promoting global worming. <laughs> well, why worms, Greg? Because <laughs> worm castings are perfect fertilizer. Mother Nature uh, invented time-release fertilizer long before miracle Grow, And it's far better and better for you. And it's natural. The worm poop uh, casting dissolves slowly because of the mucus the worm imbues into it when it puts it out. And you can plant plants directly in worm castings and it will grow like crazy. It will not burn them up like cow manure or horse manure, especially cow manure. It will not burn your crops up. It's not too, the nitrogen won't come out too fast. It comes out just right. This Mother Nature knew what it was doing. The good Lord, the creator had it all covered. So here we are. This is a 55 gallon barrel with worm castings in it, guys. All right, but see, you don't need fertilizers. Like I said, uh, worms uh, contain, uh, the worm castings have nitrates, potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, especially if you're using paper, wood products, wood chips in your worm beds. That's where you get the magnesium and uh, some of the minerals that's been depleted from our land. All right, worm castings are 100% organic. They increase your plant's yields. They protect your plants from diseases and help the soil retain moisture. See, there we go. That's inside one of my worm beds. Some of my worms. That's what my worms look like if you want to know when I saw them. There's a yummy bowl. <laughs> and worm tea. I saw local in jugs like this. Whoops. Oh, Lord. And I brew it in these 58-gallon uh, olive barrels. I use molasses. Now, guys, you can, if you don't have power or don't have some way to pump air, like a windmill, you could uh, do this with just uh, taking a couple of five-gallon buckets and pouring them back and forth for a while and just make sure it's good in the area. Do that, you know, a couple times a day, and you can have good compost tea or worm tea. So this, the beauty of worm tea is it's an all-natural liquid fertilizer and pest repellent. It will stop moles, mildew, rust. Uh, it will... Uh, kill a lot of your soft body insects directly because you got like 100,000 different species of beneficial bacteria and just a thimble full of this stuff. And so they do a lot of work, break down nutrients already in the soil to make them more readily available to your plant roots in addition to the nutrients that's contained here in. So you get a lot of advantages to worm tea. You want to feed it some kind of molasses. Maybe you want to grow some uh, sorghum cane or something when it all uh, hits the fan. But guys, this is wonderful stuff or use it pretty immediately so you don't have to keep feeding it after you brew it. Yeah, you know, that's another way to do it. So if you don't have molasses, just uh, once you got it brewed, use it fast, <laughs> like the same next day. All right, guys. So uh, yeah, I'll be selling worms again here on my website soon, ringregs.com. Uh, I'm actually doing some local sales now, but uh, just stay tuned, guys. Ah, uh, yeah, but gardening, this is a skill. Farming, gardening are going to be crucial skills because in the old days, that's what most people did. It took more people out in the farms than anything else. The bulk of the population were farmers and gardeners, and everybody needs to be a gardener. So this is a skill set. It's going to be <clears throat> going to be vital in grid down. Knowing these skills is, is something that is going to be crucial. The more people know that have these, the better off we're going to be. Just anybody don't go out and put a stick in the ground and grow food, guys. So get, get your hands dirty. Get out there and start digging. You got some good homemade tools, it looks like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get out there and start digging, folks, because <clears throat> we don't know what <clears throat> we're going to be getting into. Animal husbandry, yeah, you need meat because protein has been proven to be vital to human humanity. 
And chickens also produce eggs and meat directly if you raise enough of them. Hogs, of course, you know, the hogs are real easy to preserve by smoking and salting that meat. So a lot to be said for that. But, you know, they also do crow. <laughs> but rabbits don't crow. <laughs> and neither do worms. Rabbits and worms. So I grow worms, rabbits, and fish. And they don't crow. They don't bark. <laughs> Nobody knows I got them unless I tell them. <laughs> so these are great sources for protein. Gives you some variety, the rabbits and the uh, fish. So you might want to consider that. But yeah, knowing how to get out in the field, learning the tools, the techniques to uh, use animals as force multipliers to plow the ground. These are all going to be crucial skills that you need to learn. So that's going to be your future right there. Take off in a wagon, a cart. Although most of them, there's some tools that people ride in, but I've never seen anybody actually riding on a horse, pulling an implement. If you're not doing that, you're going to have to eat some bugs like this guy eating the grasshoppers. <laughs> you're going to have to eat some bugs and hope you can find enough to eat because you're probably going to starve to death. Or you're going to probably have to hand pick these bugs off your crops anyway, but you can feed them to your chickens. <laughs> the chickens will love you for it. So you can just take all those bugs, you hand-pick off the crops and feed them to your chickens. There you go, guys. Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you're out in the farm and uh, you're needing tools and implements and the only thing you can find is a golf putter like she's got, well, that's a tough rule unless you, she's, I don't know, she might be about to knock somebody in the head with it. I think that's what she's up to. <laughs> but, guys, if that's the only gardening tool you can find, go see your local blacksmith. He'll take care of you. He'll take that golf putter and make something useful out of it. You can actually use on the farm. <laughs> so you can find something better than a lot of golf putter. But you can also make all kinds of tools that you'll need. And this is another skill that's going to be vital in grid down. All right, let's talk about shelter here now. So uh, your home may be damaged in whatever happens. It may be the hordes, the, the mobs at four other city may burn your house down. Or you may have to flee it because of the mobs, because of pressure in the community or the government. Who knows? You may have to flee your home. Uh, you know, maybe you're not able to pay the taxes through the, 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 the new digital currency, central bank digital currency. So uh, what you may be out and about. So it's important to be able to make shelters. Using tents, I would learn how to do the stealth camping if all possible, the low level, low hanging tents, but also building little shelters, shelters, bushcrafting skills. You know, you can watch all these survival videos, and I'll probably cover this in the future one day, hopefully, how to build these little shelters out in the woods. There's tons of them out there on YouTube, from simple ones, lean-tos, to more complex ones, where you're you staying a little while longer. <laughs> That's a little bit more complex, and including, yeah, that one. But, hey, I don't know. Maybe this guy just built a bonfire. I don't know if that's a shelter at all. I think he's actually planning to build a bonfire. <laughs> yeah, be careful where you build your fire. <laughs> Yeah, this one, this one looks like he's been here a while. He's got a nice little wood, wood shelter there. He's all set up for what he's got to do. And now we're getting serious. We're taking up the next step. We're building houses. Uh, but now, that, guys, if you got to lift logs that heavy, that high, you better think it ahead. You better figure out how you can get them logs hoisted up because big logs with PV hooks and ramps, you can roll up to about shoulder height. You can get them about there. But once you get higher than that, those big logs, uh-uh, trust me. I used a tractor to raise mine higher than the log barn I built. <laughs> tractor, and you may not have a tractor. You might, you might, if you do good. You might be able to use horses, but you're going to put a pulley up somewhere real high. Make sure your chimney's got a foundation on it. And again, what's this about burning fires up against your logs? I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, this is where you're going to wind up. Hopefully, you'll have a nice, cozy home at the end of all this, maybe the one you got today. And maybe you'll have a fireplace so you can at least have heat in the wintertime. They're trying to force everybody into electricity. Well, guess what, guys? Uh, that's what's not going to work. They're trying to really force everybody against uh, any, any heat or any kind of energy other than electricity. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Make sure, though, once you built your home, that you don't have the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini hiding inside or wherever else is up here. <laughs> I folks watching this poor guy. Hmm. Uh, survival skills. Learn essential skills such as first aid. Self-defense, hunting, fishing, foraging for wild edibles, medicinals, herbs, and basic garden. We'll touch briefly on all these. There's a uh, mom and her daughter fishing. Know your wild edibles. That's wild plums, it looks like there. I bet you saw all those when I was a kid around here. Now, guys, there are there's a plant I've done two or three videos on. 
and that's wild carrots, Queen Anne's lace. I've also had to mention that there's a related plant which looks almost identical to it, which will kill you. One's food and one will kill you. That's hemlock. One way to tell the difference is Queen Anne's lace typically, not always, but usually has this purple flower right here in the middle. You won't find that on hemlock. So I've got videos where I cover that. Check out my videos. You can find them at some of them actually on my greengregs.com at wild edible slash medicinals. So you go to greengregs.com and you can find videos on a lot of these topics. So what can you eat here? Dandelion. What can you eat here? This is also medicinal. You see it? Plantain. This is uh, going to be your narrow leaf plantain. Well, it blends in with grass very well. But that head is a plantain head. I got videos on plantain. It comes with both narrow and broadleaf. There's two different varieties. I've covered that in one of my videos. Clover. Here in my area, you can eat about any clover it grows. You can eat red clover, which typically has a blue or purple top <laughs> sometimes now. Or you can eat that uh, white, uh, white clover, white blooming clover. It has a little chevron in the leaves. You can eat all that clover that grows here locally, at least in my area. So, yeah, learning the, the uh, wild craft in the bush, uh, the, the skills for herbs, which is known as witchcrafting, actually, <clears throat> collecting wild edibles. These will be vital. These, these are very important skills, especially for the, even if you're a carnivore, the medicinal side of this is huge. Learn trapping. Trapping is one of the skills that will really help bring you some extra protein and give you a little variety in your meat. Learn hunting. Traps work for you even when you're not there, you know, same way with fishing traps. Learn to hunt. This has been an important skill. You know, you can get your kids involved and learn a lot of these skills. So I like said, don't ride a horse when you got it pulling an implement. <laughs> That's a skill to learn, right? All right, you got to know first aid, basic construction, self-defense, crucial for a program a prolonged grid down guys so uh also resource management yeah believe it or not sustainable practices are invaluable skills especially at the community level ah uh, here's a, a important skill because when the grid's down a lot of your near vehicles aren't going to be working so if you got a skilled mechanic master mechanic that knows how to take an old jalopy and get it going again that's going to be golden the only problem is when you start running these guys you're going to need fuel and there's not going to be anything to pump fuel. You're not going to have gasoline or diesel fuel available. So you better learn how to make wood gas or maybe uh, alcohol. Of course, if you get you on those skills, especially the alcohol skills, you're going to be in great demand. So those are powerful skills to have mechanics. Uh, <laughs> somebody make wood gas, somebody can make alcohol. Yeah. Or if you can fix bicycles, that'll be a good skill because bicycles will probably be on the road a lot longer than, than cars. If somebody knows how to save tires from dry rotten or what to do about dry rotten tires or how we're going to make up for them after all the rubber's rotted out, leave me a note below in the, the comment section. Apparently, dry rot occurs more in these two or uh, wetter climates like Alabama and not so much out in the desert. So there might be a biological moisture-related content. The, those tires tend to dry rot more on the ground first. But we've got to have a way to keep things running. And you're not going to have factories making synthetic rubber. And there's no rubber trees that I don't know of in North America. So uh, actually, you can make rubber from uh, goldenrod. I mentioned that in my goldenrod video. That's how Henry Ford wanted to make rubber. So there might be a way to do it. <laughs> but in terms of actually getting an inflatable tire, probably not. You probably have to put a metal strap around the rim. And if you're lucky, you might be able to put a rubber strap around it or something that's softer than metal. It might last a little while. Yeah, I knew a blacksmith and when I actually bought my forge from that's what he used to do at one time. So yeah, and but hey, it's important to be able to drive machines that don't need fuel. <laughs> a horse is a great one because a horse can eat grass and drink water. So a horse would be a great thing to have if you know how to ride a horse and got some horses, you might be ahead of the game. It may take a while to get enough horses to breed up to make uh, up what we'll need in that day and time. Woodworking skills are vital, especially if you know how to do it with the hand tools. That's all you're probably going to have. So learn woodworking, learn it with primitive old hand tools. This will be a vital skill, carpentry, uh, building houses, building furniture, making water pipes even. Yeah, the first water pipe system in Huntsville will use wooden pipes. That's why Alabama. Ah, and blacksmithing will be huge. And of course, if you're driving a big hammer like that, you're going to be huge too, just like this guy. So, you know, really buff you out. <laughs> all these blacksmiths are showing here, they got big muscles. They're driving big hammers all the time. 
Amen, guys. That's a big chore, but yeah, you'll be a he man. <laughs> so there you go. He makes he can also swing a sword pretty good. <laughs> Medical skills, first aid. There's gonna be so much going on, so many injuries, things happening, and you got to worry about the getting attacked. These are going to be vital skills to really understand. All right, guys. But we're needing the community because no one person can know all these skills in, in, in terms of mastering them. That's why we need communities to share the resources. It can be a way that we can rebuild. Uh, building a community of like-minded individuals will help you share resources, skills, and knowledge. And one way to get started with that, if you've not already done so, is go to survivaltribenetwork.com survivaltribenetwork.com that is a uh, resource that wise out one of my uh, partners in trying to build these communities uh, you know i started this up uh, on my channel she had already had her own community started by the way and uh, she joined with us and uh, she actually paid big money out of her pocket to set up survival tri survival tribe network.com check it out guys Let's see, what we need is um, cooperation, resource sharing, mutual support networks. Uh, the cool thing is you just need to know that no man is an island, unless you're Jeremiah Johnson. No man is an island. That's why we need the communities, guys, and especially when it comes to defense. Unless you're Jeremiah Johnson, you can take out everybody comes at you. But she actually did. But they did come at it one at a time. That man was incredible. Until he got old. He got out of the mountains when he got old, though. <laughs> He survived incredible odds. So, yeah, guys, this is an idea for community or this. Yeah, communities can be lovely. Well, that looks a little primitive, but that may be what you got, guys. I don't guess we kind of processing equipment here for garden supplies, I suppose. Looks like we got some row covers up here. We got a lot of block wall. That's good. Need more of that and less of this wood up high. We'll go over that in a minute. But food, guys, food, food, food. The raised beds, garden beds. Look at that, guys. I like the rock. That's going to be important. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Effective leadership and governance structures are essential to provide guidance and make uh, informed decisions, allocate resources, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, leadership. Every community has got to have some leadership. How do you minister justice? Uh, get things done. So, yep, every group needs to have a leader or leaders and you know some tasks and skills that you can distribute between the people so leadership is paramount even when you're out especially when you're out on the battlefield don't forget guys faith matters especially since it's trying times where people are going to be challenged physically and spiritually faith matters all right security and safety maintain a law of order securing public safety and protecting communities from potential threats is vital yeah, you might have law enforcement. You may have to make your own law enforcement. Community defense groups, effective communication channels to handle emergency situations. That's why, you know, those uh, Lariatios might do you for a while, for a while. You might have to organize your own communities for defense and law and order. That's what I'm telling you. you, you your communications may be old-fashioned. You may have to have couriers, flags, smoke signals, especially as those radios break down. Or maybe you don't have enough of them. Yeah, this looks like a herd of zombies coming after you. <laughs> yeah, we may be in the middle of a civil war. We might get invaded, probably less likely. But uh, warfare is a natural state of tribes. That's why in a tribe, every, you know, every able-bodied man is known as a warrior. That's your badge of honor. If you're not a warrior, who are you? So uh, every tribe and nation state. Now, nation states can come up with standing armies. In some nations, it was everybody that was able-bodied. Also, kind of like the warrior societies, but uh, standing armies and nations. But wars have been going on from the beginning. Well, it's not going to get any better in tribal world. It's even worse. Tribes, entire tribes can get wiped out by wars. I mean, uh, the Indians that were here when DeSoto came through Alabama uh, and, and in his past back, what, 1500s or something like that, or 1600s, they weren't the same Indian tribes the English settlers saw later. Not even the same tribes, different tribes. All right, what's wrong with this picture here? Well, we got, oh, we got some rock or sandbags. That's all good. They got some troops. Well, for one, these guys are in the wrong place. They need to be behind the embankments. And two, nice rock here. But when you got all these buildings sitting up here on top of it, that's all just targets. That'll all be burnt by the enemy. 
And yeah, yeah that's not safe in the, in the get go. That's a little better. They got rock going all the way up. But where's the sector fires? And you guys, you don't need to be out front. <laughs> not unless you got some guys, but maybe behind these windows reinforcing you, but they got to be in the right spots. Perimeter defense is crucial. Foxholes are great. Those foxholes, you, you, you get parts of yourself under the ground so you're not in direct line of fire. And what can't you can't get in the ground, you can augment with sandbags. But this guy's, you know, he's still a little bit exposed. And somebody could lob a grenade in here because this foxhole is wide open. I'll show you how to deal with a couple ways to deal with that in a minute. Like this. Uh, grenades and artillery can be blocked by having a nice roof overhead. So over time, you may start as foxhole out simple. If you're going to be there for a long time, you keep improving it. You always improve your shelter, your home, your foxhole, whatever. They may be one and the same. The fighting position may be one of the windows in your house, your castle. But you don't want people lobbing grenades in or artillery. So anything you put on the top to block that. Now, this guy, they're, they're ready for artillery. They got one, two, three, four levels of logs. They got some rocks up here and soil. Yeah, that's very nicely fortified with some heavy-duty bombardment. And look at this. You got a door here. And the other thing you need to understand is these walkways, the trenches that are connecting these uh, uh, dugouts, these bunkers, the foxholes, they are not straight because if they're straight, somebody could get down here and shoot everybody in it, including into the building. So you make these crooked. You jog them back and forth, uh, not straight lines. That is crucial for building these kind of things. Look, what do you do when you're wet out in the open like a desert where everything is flat? Look, the, 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 the protect yourself in the line of fire is so crucial that troops train to even dig out in the desert. And as they dig out some, they're able to throw up some dirt that will actually help protect them through a parapet of sorts on a small one. Just a small wedge of dirt. All that helps, guys. Every little bit helps. It, you know, round can only go, it can't go very far in dirt, actually. A round has to bullet. Ah, now this is a very less an object type foxhole. I can teach you a lot from this picture right here. For many things. For one, you see that there's two sectors of fire set up here. You got two firing positions in this foxhole. That's not a firing position. I'll explain that in a minute. You see, it's, it's cleared out where they can sweep back and forth. See, this guy is aiming back this way across this guy's sector fire. These sectors of fire interlock. You can also see they've cleared out brush. So if anybody's coming, they'll be able to see them well out in the distance. They probably even cleared out the underbrush even back in here. The brush was cleared out. They already cleared all the trees because they don't want somebody having something to hide behind when they're coming at you. So it's a wide open field. If you're going to come at these guys, you've got to cross a wide open space or they're firing at you. You're going to have a tough time getting from back here to right here. Ah, but Greg, they'll throw a grenade. Okay, what's this hole for, by the way? Notice this hole in here. This looks like a turkey foot, right? You got steps here, getting down into it. You got a firing position here, a firing position. But there's also these wedges of dirt sticking out and a hole right here. When somebody throws a grenade, and this is slope, somebody throws a grenade in, you hope it will roll in, but you kick it. You kick it down that slope, you kick it out of here, whatever, you kick it down in that hole, and then you hunker in on your corners, and when this thing blows up, it's going to throw shrapnel back this way. Don't be where this guy's at. Uh, it's going to throw the shrapnel back here, and you should be able to survive a grenade blast that way. At least not be hit by the shrapnel. Your ears are going to have problems, but you can survive a grenade blast. you got a hole here. This is a grenade sump. We're almost here. All right, we're mostly with this presentation. Interlocking sectors of fire. Each of these triangles is like, you know, we got some foxholes here or firing positions, maybe in a house or building. And uh, this two guys in each one, and they got fire. And actually, these should overlap, but uh, my drawing tool in PowerPoint wasn't that great and I was in a hurry. So, but you actually want the interlock to go over each other a good bit. In fact, you want them to cover each other so much that if you lose a person in any of these positions, that the adjacent guys totally cover that position. That's what you got to have interlocked in sectors of fire if you got to defend your perimeter. And if you're being overrun, what you want to have is a real high rate of fire uh, weapon that uh, you could, uh, a crew serve weapon is best, like maybe an M60 or something that you could put in one of these positions. And if you're actually out a little bit, you're even better. You know, kind of the old Star Force, right? So, so you'll be able to put down a final, uh, what we call a final uh line of protective fire going to wherever the advance is coming from and then you go out the other side you run out the other side and you let 
Your final line of protective fire is to enable most of your forces, most of your people to get out of there as you're being overrun. It's to give them a little space to get out. Of course, whoever is the one holding the final, you better have your toughest, meanest fighter maintain that line of fire because then they got to get out of there. But hopefully they will use a reverse technique to what I'm about to show you for advancing on the sniper to make their extraction out. Uh, kind of reverse to what I'm about to show you here. So on the imagination can cook that. That's a topic for a bigger video on detailed tactics for fighting. Ah, uh, now what, another thing you need to have is make sure that you are uh, covered if you're out in the uh, on maneuvers. You don't want people to see. If you can be seen, you can be shot and killed in three seconds. So it's important to have. Uh, maybe a ghillie suit, which is a, a suit you wear, which has foliage and other stuff attached to it so that you're hard to see. You want to blend in as much as possible, not just camouflage clothes, but actually put uh, localized on. But a ghillie suit is a really rough suit that uh, sometimes you can make them with blankets or capes. You can make this ghillie suit. Uh, nets, attach uh, local foli foliage to them and stuff like that. Now, these are snipers. A lot of tufts of grass, except they got something to stick out. Here we got two snipers and two spotters. You tip, you, this is a training situation because you really shouldn't have two snipers side by side. They should be separated by a lot of distance, definitely more than that. Uh, usually you just might get, sometimes you get a lone sniper and sometimes a sniper gets a spotter. So this is what's going to be, one of these guys is what you got to worry about in prepping because uh, you're going to be a high value target. You got food, you got tools, you got water, means to purify water. You got stuff they want. Maybe they just want you. Maybe they're real hungry. But you're outside doing your chores, running your trap line, taking uh, care of your garden, and you're hoeing, and you're all busy hoeing. Well, these guys just take you out. Ping, you don't even see them. You don't know where he's at. And he may not even come immediately to get your stuff. They may uh, wait for somebody else to come check you out, and then ping, they take them out. You know, if, if you don't have a, a well-organized community, They'll take everyone out and not even show their faces unless everybody goes and hides indoors. And then that's when they send in their goons to get you. But uh, if it's just your lawn prepper, they got you, they'll go get what you got. Easy pickings, easy pickings. The snipers got it easier than anybody unless you know what to do to take care of the sniper. And here's what you do, guys. You got to advance on this sniper. You need two different crews, two different teams. Uh, a squad is made of two teams. That's why you need a community, because every community should have a squad. One person cannot form a squad. One person can't even form one of these teams. The reason you want two separate teams is you want to outflank the sniper by coming at it from different directions, hopefully further apart than this. You would totally want to outflank this sniper. Now, even as you're getting close, because this guy's got a long-range weapon, you got to be careful. So what you got to do is you put two people here putting down fire on that sniper. And while they're putting fire on that sniper, uh, you got another soldier can advance. A couple of other soldiers can be moving because if he pops up to shoot this guy, you, you got him covered. So once this guy gets in place behind a tree or a rock, then he allows the other guy to, to move. So you each ratchet forward one after another. You see, now this guy's took cover. He's putting down predictive fire and this guy's advancing. And now this guy took cover. He's allowing this guy to advance. And you just keep doing that until you get right up on the sniper and either take him out or you know, they're going to have to get them run, you know, you, if nothing else, or be taken out directly. You Then you got everybody putting their fire down on them. One thing you might want to think about, though, is you don't want to just fire everything. You know, you want a multi-round capacity. But if you fire everything all at once, you know, you got to get, you got to space that firing out so your buddy's got time to, to get it to the other objective. It might take them a minute to get over there. If you got a 30-round capacity and you're firing every 30, uh, every two minutes, and uh, excuse me, every two seconds, then you've got uh, then you, you you got them covered for a minute, but you want to take all your rounds out. You got to kind of space it out. You can't just be, uh, yeah, that's good for Hollywood, but it's not real in reality. So you got to learn how to space. You got to put down enough enough fire rate. This guy don't want to poke his head out, but not so much that you're not going to label this guy to get this target or objective. Also, you better think about how much total rounds you get. You got enough to go in and move to all your obstacles and take this guy. You got to think ahead, plan, think. So you just got there and you're John Wayne, you know, doing the Rambo thing or whatever. And you, you know, that'll work, guys. You got to think. Your brain's your most vital weapon, guys. 
Ah, uh, you know, we may have to go, you may have to go maneuvers to go get resources, to go get food, water, or whatever. And so if you're out marching, bunch of together, even if you're not soldiers, being this close together is too close. One grenade, one artillery round will take you all out, or somebody with one sweep of a, a nug, automatic nug, <laughs> which can be made automatic by certain alterations, guys. You can take all these poor guys out instantly. These guys are further apart, but they're still way too close. They'd be six meters apart. These guys are too close. Six meters apart. Oh, yeah. And by the way, what do you do if you're ambushed? You charge. You can't sit there like a sitting duck. Uh, they, they'd be like you're a, a fish in a barrel. Uh, they'll get you. So the only your only recourse, because you're probably out in the open, is to charge. I don't know about those weapons. Ah, okay, good. This is just right. This guy's out there six meters apart, perfect distance. you got to learn to do hand signals because you don't need to be jabbering when you're walking through the woods on maneuvers. You say something, you'll be heard, bang, you fall. Keep your mouth shut. Move quietly. It's not Hollywood. In Hollywood, I go, blah, 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 blah. Well, you won't survive. There's nothing uh, in Hollywood that resembles how you actually uh, take care of yourself in this situation. Hollywood got it all wrong. Do what Hollywood does, and you're not going to survive. <laughs> six meters apart, guys. That's the key thing. But watch your six. You never know what's coming up behind you, guys. Look out! It's going to get you. <laughs> Uh, that's why you need some guys behind him, and not these guys. And hopefully the zombies are going to be as dumb as these guys and all march together because then they're, they're not going to be a, as much of a threat as they think they are. Uh, medical care is going to be crucial, guys, because like I said earlier, you're going to have so many injuries. This is one of the key uh, key skills to learn. Hopefully you can maintain or come up with some level of power to, for some of the medical devices that are needed to run for a while. It all helps. So, yeah, that leads us into generating electricity. You know, I hope this guy's got some wood gas to go with that generator. <laughs> it won't be gasoline around for long. <clears throat> Solar panels, wind turbines, they're all force multipliers. They all can help you run medical equipment, communications devices, be light sources. They all can give you uh, a leg up for a while as long as they operate. Sooner or later, though, Something's going to break down. This whole thing will come down. So you know, we got it. We're going to have to get more and more primitive to stay alive and to stay ahead. But the, all these things can help us out for a while. If you want to put a wind turbine up, all right. This house is kind of a tower, but he's going to have to go a lot higher than that to get that thing up there. <laughs> wind turbines are part of the solution set, though. Solar panels definitely put some solar panels on the roof, guys. If you can do it, wind turbines, solar panels. Now this guy's got it right. He's got a home. A lot of thermal mass to keep his uh, temperature stable, that having to use a lot of electricity or power, which won't be available. Uh, he's even got thermal mass on the roof. That's good. And he's growing big garden plants. <laughs> and he's got some kind of solar energy. So this guy, he's a step ahead here. At the community level, you might want to have a, a water mill, even with primitive tools that can work for pumping water. Grinding grain, running millstones. That's how most of these mills used to be. They used to be a grinder for grinding grain. Water mills. That's what they used to do. But you might generate electricity this way. Come up with a little hydro plant. So that's things to think about, guys. And once you got, you know, some power, and you can kind of sort of maintain things, uh, establishing a reliable communication network are crucial for uh, coordinating efforts, sharing information, and staying connected. I know what's coming at you, what's coming over the hill. Is there an invasion force coming? You want to know these kind of things. Is there some opportunity or some threat you need to know about? Uh, somebody forming a country over the uh, over in another state. Alternate communications methods such as two-way radio, short-way radios, and even uh, messenger services. Again, that's your ground career. Can become essential. So if you know how to do these things, that's a good skill to have. Most of your ham operators actually have backup radios and they're kind of they tend to be prepared for an EMP more than anybody else because they're emergency providers. So how are you gonna protect your electronic devices for when it goes bad? You need a Faraday cage to help protect them from EMP. Yeah, we're finally getting here. <laughs> a Faraday cage will be a very important thing to have. So Faraday cage, uh, if, if it's tight enough, it probably needs to be like 50 decibels uh, and, and shield protectiveness. So it needs to be very tight if you're using a all right, we'll miss that in a minute. So what you might do is use aluminum foil. Wrap your radio in aluminum foil. 
that's one way. But you better wrap it with good heavy aluminum foil and probably double or triple wrap it. Make sure it's not all crumpled up. You really want to seamlessly uh, close as much of it as possible. You could turn the radio on and then wrap it and see how good your techniques are. Uh, this is all wrong here. A trash can is important to use, but if you're just throwing everything in there and all is it too full, but if you got direct contact with the metal, with the device you're trying to protect you, then you're, you're right there on the, the source of the charge. You want to line the inside with cardboard. Now you put some planks in the bottom or a concrete block or some insulator. Then when you put the lid on, if you got some metal tape to put around, around it, I've seen that at Lowe's. Then that, I have bought some, I don't know where my roll is now. That is the thing to do to actually stop uh, EMP as much as possible. And then you also want to ground it too. Uh, you can use ammo boxes. Ammo boxes is another thing. That's not an ammo box. But anyway, <laughs> there's anti-static bags. They help. Really, you want different layers, multiple layers. Like use anti-static bags, maybe an aluminum foil, and put it in a garbage can. <laughs> ground the garbage can. That takes the E1 form of the electromagnetic pulse and runs it to the ground. Of course, E3 might come up through the ground. That's why you want everything in your can insulated from both of them. So, uh, yeah. All right, guys, but there is hope for the future. You know, all this sounds scary. If, if you prepare and get through all this, we can build a better society on the other side. And I have a concept for home you can live in, make a living out of. It's actually a tenth of an acre within this home for all your food in. Call it a derivation unit. And these walls are thick, give you thermal mass to, uh, to uh, be able to maintain temperature without running the air conditions and heat. Uh, you think it'd be hot in this greenhouse, but you'd have to, you'd want to open these up and pull water through, uh, uh, air through the ground for cooling, or you put shade cloth up there, or so or transparent solar cells for extra cooling. Anyway, guys, so this, uh, I've got a whole presentation on this topic, actually several I've covered on this channel, on universal habitat topic. I will come back to it again in the near future. And so this is, this is your living area in here. You got bedrooms back in there. You can go in on the roof. You're going in the lawn. Yeah, it's a multi-layer house with lots of capabilities. It can be beautiful. No, it doesn't even have to look like this. You can actually use hoops up here if you wanted to. Or maybe if you're in a real hot climate, you actually got shade cloth up here. Maybe nothing on the roof at all, especially if there's no rain where you're at. <laughs> so there's many different ways to implement it, but, but, but to have a home, you can grow on your roof, grow on a tenth of an acre, and have a lot of thermal mass for temperature stability. These are key elements to it. Uh, so these are other kind of homes that uh, you might want to go for the community. So these are all things to look at for the side. But whatever you do, don't follow this guy. He can lead you to bad places. <laughs> but whatever you do, more than anything else, always remember, never, ever let cousins marry cousins. Oh, my gosh. Make sure you got a network of tribes and communities and that uh, the young folks can uh, meet each other in these different communities because we don't want folks looking like this guys don't let cousins marry cousins <laughs> or brothers and sisters even worse you, you need some separation so we need survival communities and we need lots of them and we need communication between them and the young people uh, as they get to that age they need to be able to mingle with people from other communities <laughs> so guys stay informed i bring you a lot of stuff on this topic you can go to my this youtube channel if you're not already subscribed subscribe bang the other uh, no, uh. Bang the up notification bell and click all. You can also check out my greengregs.com. And this is my YouTube Green Gregs. Uh, if you put that in a browser, it's going to give you the ability to click on my channel. It will take you straight to the channel. But if you put in at Green Gregs in uh, YouTube, it will again show you where my channel is at. So that is the actual URL to my channel. Anyway, guys, hope you all enjoyed us. I hope it was informative. We just covered tactics, strategy, military, agriculture, how to grow your food, how to defend your tribe, primers of defense, what to do about a sniper. Uh, who ever covered all this in one video before? <laughs> the actual threat of the grid. Uh, I've got videos that specialize in these different things, and I will do more on those in the future. That's why you'll subscribe, bang that notification bell, and click all. But so I know you watched it this long. I want to hint. I want to hint. Tell me, Greg, I got a means to cut wood. It's going to last me a long time. Just tell me that. <laughs> Actually, my bolo knife is my favorite. But uh, just tell me. Oh, yeah, I bought this from Canadian Prepper, by the way. Those will be good. They won't be good forever. Those teeth will go 
won't stay sharp forever. And these saws are, yeah, you're not really going to sharpen that saw. It's not a saw made for sharpening, but it's one of these force multipliers that gets you going for a while. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things like that to bear in mind. So guys, hope you've uh, enjoyed the video. Tell me that, you know, talk about it. I got ways to cut wood. That way I know you watched it this far. <laughs> With that, I'm going to say, keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel. I'm probably going to go live tonight if you're watching this today. This is taking me, this is my fifth attempt to do this video. I've been hours trying to make this video. Uh, I had all kinds of problems with Zoom. I finally got that straightened out and somebody called me. I'm going to make the video. So, wow. Anyway, appreciate it, everybody. Thank you all for watching. And do watch as many of my videos as you can. Give me a thumbs up. Help me with the algorithms. Make comments below in the videos. All that helps the algorithms. Comments to other people's comments. All that stuff helps, guys. Let's, we are a community. Let's have the community discussion. Check out the Survival Tribe Network uh, dot com. I also go to FreedomRestorationFoundation.org. And of course, there's PrepWithGreg.com. Thank you all for watching. Greg out.